And for those of you who've joined us, um, welcome and thank you very much for being on time. It's a tremendous effort. Uh, I would just like to make it known to you that we are recording this session. So for those of, of you who couldn't make it out there, for your colleagues, you can let them know that we are recording this session and you can pass that on. The link for that will be on the Australian Urban Observatory website. I'll just briefly go through the agenda for today so that you get a sense of what we're planning and what you'll get to see. Um, I'm going to start with an introduction and my name is Dr Lucy Gunn and I'm a Senior Research Fellow at RMIT University. Uh, I'm one of the leads for this work and it's been a great pleasure to be part of it. Um, following the introduction, we will have a, a short um, presentation by Professor Lauren Ricketts, who is uh, representing the funders for this work. And following that, another short presentation by uh, Motetsa Chalik from the Victorian Department of Transport, who's one of our partners on this project. We will then have a presentation by Patrick Harris as one of our guest speakers, and we'll have a, a short Q&A session on that. Um, and then we move to the official launch of the Transport Health Assessment Tool for Melbourne. And that will start with an introduction to the Australian Urban Observatory by by Melanie Davin and then we will have the official launch of the tool which is That Melbourne which will be by Dr Belen Zapata Diomedi and also Dr Alan Both, who have been um, really the, the main modellers behind some of this work. We'll finish up with a Q&A session and then we'll have some closing comments. So without further ado, we might uh, start the presentation. So this is really to launch the Transport Health Assessment Tool for Melbourne or That Melbourne. And by the end of this session, I hope that you'll all have learned a little bit more about the tool, a little bit about the modelling behind it, how to use it and where to find it, which is in the Australian Urban Observatory. In welcoming you all to the presentation, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the people of the Woi Warang and Boon Warang language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation uh, on whose lands we meet today and we acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Now, before we begin, I'd like to talk a little bit about the project in a broad sense. Uh, this is a partnership project that sits between the Victorian Department of Transport and also RMIT University, and in particular, the Centre for Urban Research. This project has been looking at health benefits and in particular health benefits that come from transportation. Uh, this component of the project has been looking at replacing short car trips, and this is what's in our tool. And we replace those with either walking, cycling, or a combination of both. And we do that through a series of different scenarios which um, are embedded within the tool itself. The team behind this work are all of these people that you see here and it's an interdisciplinary team and we have expertise in epidemiology, in public health, psychology, in economics and policy, in planning, uh, in geospatial science and also modelling and transport modelling and statistics. So a very um, a very broad group of people with a broad range of skills, but that's what's necessary to deliver this kind of a project. Um, at this point, I'd like to take the time to thank each and every one of them for the role that they've played in this work. We couldn't have done, them, done this work without each and every single one of you, and it's a tremendous effort, and I think it's a really fantastic tool. And I hope that for those of you out who are out there, um, who, are, who are listening to this presentation, that you really get a chance to appreciate the work that they've done. Um, so you'll hear from some of these people today, um, so I won't go into too much detail in introducing them explicitly because you'll hear from them soon enough. And likewise, we have our guest speakers and I'll go into more detail on each of those in turn. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Victorian Department of Transport who are not only our partners on this project, but also for the in-kind support that they've provided in a lot of the research that we're doing that is aligned to this work as well. I'd like to acknowledge our funders, which is RMIT University, and in particular, the Enabling Capability Platform, um, the Enabling Capability Platform Opportunity Fund for Research and Translation. I'd also like to acknowledge our partners, the Australian Prevention Partnership Centre and the Australian Urban Observatory, which is where this tool sits. Now, before we, we rattle on into the rest of the presentation and the rest of the webinar, I'd like to set the scene by explaining a little bit about what a health impact assessment is, because this work relates to it. But at the same time, it's slightly different. So I wanted to explain that a health impact assessment is a means of assessing the health impacts of policies, plans and projects in diverse economic sectors using quantitative, qualitative and participatory techniques. A health impact assessment is a five step process and we don't have time to go through those five steps, but it's a a world renowned approach for understanding the health impacts that come from the kind of things we do when we are planning and planning on making changes in our environment. Understanding what those health impacts are helps us to make a better helps us to make a or to do a better job of planning in the first place. So to really support the positive health benefits and to mitigate the negative ones. Our tool, as you may have guessed, is a quantitative tool 
and it is helping to provide evidence which then supports advocacy. So with that evidence, with that numerical uh, quantities that you can get out of our tool, you can put those into your reports or for business cases and it's really to advocate for the kinds of infrastructure that support active and healthy behaviours. So at this point, um, I'm going to hand over to our first guest speaker, uh, which is Professor Lauren Ricketts, who is the Interim Urban Futures Enabling Capability Platform Director from RMIT University. So uh, Lauren, I might get you to share your screen. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lucy. It's fantastic uh, to be here and to have this opportunity to uh, really launch what is one of the most uh, standout projects um, that we've uh, had in recent times. So let me just get that up. Really don't need too many slides, but I just wanted to um, put this one up here. Uh, I also wanted to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking from the Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung uh, country uh, of the Eastern Kulin Nation uh, and to pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. And of course, when we acknowledge country, it really draws our attention to where we are, to the places that we're speaking from, to our local neighbourhoods. And the pandemic has also reinforced uh, our attention to where we sit, to where we're located, uh, often now located both for work and uh, play, if you like, in the one place. And with all of that focus, it's drawn our attention to sort of the core of what this project's looking at, which is this question of making more livable cities, of making more livable urban futures. And when we think about that, the role of the seemingly mundane, but actually extremely uh, powerful question of how walkable and how rideable um, our local areas are, uh, is incre uh, increasingly recognised as really crucial. So this project's really pointing to something that, um, as I said, seems like a small question, but actually is at the heart of what it is to create uh, better urban futures. And one of the issues is that while some of us are privileged, privileged to live in places that have at least some um, walkable and rideable routes, um, these, uh, these, these uh, facilities, the infrastructure for that is far from evenly dispersed across our cities. And that unevil, uneven access to active transport infrastructure is one of the really big issues that we need to tackle. And partly that's because of those direct health uh, impacts that, um, and benefits that we'll hear about. And partly it's because of those feedbacks through the climate system, which is my own area of research, looking at those feedbacks and understanding how it relates to the greenhouse gases and of course to those uh, further indirect effects on health as well. So in all these different ways, the issue is actually uh, really at the nexus of some of the, the crucial issues that we need to deal with to create more livable cities and better urban futures. So as I indicated, today's project uh, really is an exemplar for the Urban Futures Enabling Capability Platform that I have the pleasure of directing. Uh, now the Enabling Capability Platform, it's a bit of a mouthful, we all call it ECPs um, in RMIT land, um, is one of eight uh, interdisciplinary cross-university uh, platforms uh, which is really set up to foster the sort of applied, real-world impactful research that this project demonstrates. It's about bringing together people that often don't even know each other exist from their different uh, dusty corners of the university to tackle really important, crucial issues, in our case, particularly around urban futures. And so it's incredibly uh, uh, important to have projects such as this one to inspire others in the university to do similar sorts of work. Now, one of the things about this project that's not only um, really notable is not just the, the, the topic that work at the interface of transport and health, uh, but also the fact that it's really doing so in a way that makes sure that the results uh, are usable um, and, and highly accessible. So really creating a, a tool that actually enables those to be translated into action. And uh, in doing that, uh, as we'll hear, the project has drawn on the great expertise in the Australian Urban Observatory. So a real shout out to Melanie Davin um, and colleagues and, and Lucy and everyone working uh, to set that up because that is such a useful um, uh, enterprise, such a, a useful initiative. 
uh, and also working directly with uh, partners from the outset. And of course, in this case, that's with our valued uh, partner, the Victorian Government, particularly the Department of Transport. So in all these ways, this project uh, is something that the Urban Futures ECP has been extremely proud to support. I also wanted to mention that at the moment, RMIT is very dedicated to what it's calling the post-COVID-19 restart initiatives. Uh, noting, of course, that post-COVID-19 is something of a optimistic uh, <laughs> uh, phrasing, but nevertheless, I'm sure you know what we mean, which is about trying to find the silver lining in this massive global disruption that we're experiencing and trying to think about how we can use this moment of disruption to actually create more positive futures. And so what this is doing is complementing the work of the ECPs by bringing together Again, researchers from across the university, but also partners from across different parts of the university to really uh, work towards uh, what we've got here is five different starts, one being a greener start. There's all sorts of work here on things like uh, green urban precincts, for example, a healthier start, uh, including work on mental health, where again, exercise is of such vital importance, a digital start, pointing to the role of data and digital initiatives, such as the Australian Urban Observatory, a better work start, including tackling the question of how we can uh, make the most of this new work from home reality. Uh, many of us uh, are now uh, uh, part of, and a fairer start. So that question of justice, including urban justice, including spatial justice, who has access to what infrastructure. So again, you can see the relevance of this particular project. And so with that, I would just like to congratulate uh, all of the researchers involved, Lucy and the team, um, in putting together the um, transport health assessment tool for Melbourne. Uh, I won't quite declare it launched yet. I think we have <laughs> a few presentations to get through before then, but I'd like to announce it pre-launched uh, and congratulate them and uh, wish you all the best uh, for the rest of the webinar. So thanks very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that, Lauren. I, I think the team certainly appreciates it. I, I certainly do. Um, we now have our next guest speech, speaker, who is Motetsa Chalak, and Motetsa is one of our partners on this project. He is a senior economist with the Department of Transport, and he conducts and reviews economic assessment for transport projects. Motetsa has a PhD in economics and has previously worked at the Victorian Department of Treasury and Finance and at the University of Western Australia. So at this point, Motetsa, I'll ask you to share your screen and you can get on with your presentation. Thank Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Lucy. Yeah, sure. And um, let's see. Yeah, so it was it is very exciting thing to uh, work with RMIT uh, on valuing health impact of active transport for transport, uh, which would help for transport pra planning. Uh, as Lucy mentioned, I'm a senior economist at the Department of Transport with a PhD in economics uh, from Wageningen University. <clears throat> uh, so uh, my main responsibilities is that I assess uh, proposed public transport strategies and investment proposals and also conduct economic assessment of pro proposed public transport projects. And for that, I apply financial and economic valuation uh, frameworks. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we also review economic assessments for uh, public transport proposals. And for, uh, for these economic assessments, we are looking at uh, measuring def different benefits. Uh, and these benefits of uh, transport projects could be health benefit, travel time savings, and reduced uh, environmental externalities as examples. For example, uh, transport project, uh, a, a big uh, important part of a transport project could be that it reduces travel time. Uh, and we recognize that the transport project that enhance active transport provide health benefits and it's important to measure these health benefits uh, correctly. Uh, we also recognize that the health is important, so the uh, a large, as we know that like a large proportion of our population isn't sufficiently active. For example, about 50%, uh, above 50% are not sufficiently active and not getting physical activity <clears throat> is, uh, 
enough physical activity can lead to heart disease, uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, etc. So improving the measurement of health benefits for active transport uh, can improve economic assessment for transport projects, which can help uh, prioritize projects that enhance physical activity. This could lead to uh, population health, and that's one of the motivation of our collaboration with RMIT. Uh, currently, the, we are measuring and including health benefits to public transport uh, projects, uh, and we're using the guidelines such as ATAP, which is Australian Transport Assessment and Planning Guidelines, and also uh, Transport for uh, New South Wales Guidelines. And basically, in these guidelines, the way that health benefits are calculated are uh, <clears throat> by adding uh, health system costs to reduce uh, morbidity and mortality values. And uh, to calculate the morbidity and mortality values, uh, a general values have been used. And these are like, for example, daily, dailies, which are days lost due to, um, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, so it, it would be years lost, um, due to death or uh, reduced uh, productivity. The other general value we, uh, is used that to calculate this health benefit is proportion of the health loss uh, attributed to physical activity and also adult inactive population in Australia. So as you see that these values can be very general. Uh, and um, one of the so uh, so one of the, our motivation is to get a more accurate and Victorian specific values. So the main motivation for us to collaborate with RMIT is to is the importance of the health in general that we acknowledge, and also acknowledgement that uh, there is a need for improvement in the way that health benefit is uh, uh, valued. Uh, and having a more Victorian specific valuation, as you saw, most of the values were general, the ones that are uh, provided right now in the guidelines. Uh, we are hoping that improve that this would help uh, improving the economic assessment for projects that enhance uh, active transport, uh, and that could uh, improve the prioritization. Uh, for the projects that uh, increase the uh, or enhance health impact of active transport. And we are hoping that this would uh, eventually result in a more healthy population and improved uh, social welfare. Anyway, thanks very much. So this was uh, my presentations, the reasons and motivation for us to collaborate with RMIT. Uh, I hand it uh, the, the stage back to uh, Lucy. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, yes, thank you. All right, wonderful. Thank you very much, Morteza. Um, though we're very pleased to have you as partners um, in this work, and we think it's really integral that the Department of Transport is really picking up um, the interest in measuring health benefits. I think there's a lot that can come from transport, and being able to measure it is is really uh, key to understanding what its value is. So we're very pleased to have you as our partners. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, now we're ready for our next guest speaker, which is um, Dr. Patrick Harris, who is a senior research fellow at University of New South Wales. He's an applied researcher and has worked across Australia and internationally with the health sector and other sectors to improve considerations of health and health equity in policy and planning. His expertise is in the inclusion of health in public policy, specifically in the use of health impact assessments, the links between health and urban planning, and the inclusion of health and environmental assessments of major infrastructure projects. So I couldn't think of a better person to help uh, explain this topic. So Patrick, if you're ready, um, perhaps if you'd like to share your screen and we can get started with your presentation. Okay, Thank you. Okay. Great, great. Thanks very much. Can you can you see that? All right, everybody. Um, I, was, I was saying before I've got a, a technical issue with multiple screens. I'm not quite sure I'm on top of, but can you see that? Uh, I'm not seeing it just yet, but it, uh, perhaps others are. Mm, anyone else? No, no, there's a few people saying no. OK, hang on, what am I going to do here then? Because I can see it fine. Um, right. Uh, now, what if I do? What I I'll can do, share I'll, mine. If that helps. I, uh, no, probably not. I'll just try and do something uh, magical and I'll be two seconds to see if hopefully it'll work. <laughs> OK. All right. So I'm now into my laptop and off my screen, so I'll do it that way. So can everyone see that now? 
I can't see it. No. Okay, this is quite odd. Keep, so, yeah, does someone? Does keep, someone keep clicking, Patrick? If you have, there'll be multiple screens you can pick from. And what's critical is. Oh, I need to share. Sc I need to share my screen. I'm being yes. idiot. Sorry. Ah, right. Okay. Well. Okay, hang on a second. So that's the little button next to the yeah, yeah, button that says it. leave. Here we go. Here yep. we go. All right. That was my. That's my idiocy. I do apologise. My staff here call there me. There we go. Okay, so, this is looking good. So, this is looking good. Okay. This is right, looking good. good. There we go. Wonderful. All right. Good. Um, okay. Great. I'm just going to do this. So uh, while I before I begin, I'd, I'd just like to acknowledge the the uh, the land of the um, Gandag Gandagara and Tharawal people that I'm I'm speaking from here in southwest Sydney. Um, and acknowledge my uh, acknowledge the, the, the emerging elders, uh, past, present, and future. Um, sorry, that's a bit of a mouthful. Um, I, uh, by way of background to why I was asked to do this very interesting uh, or talk on this very interesting topic for you, is that I, uh, my history is is well originally in, in health impact assessments. So I've done lots of health impact assessments all over the world, and um, when I uh, about sort of five years into doing health impact assessments, I realised that we were struggling to get sort of institutional, um, I guess, uh, support to do that work. And so I went off and did my PhD to understand how health intersected with with really what we call healthy public policy, or some of you will get to, or have heard health in all policies. Um, and uh, during that time, I then got an NHMRC fellowship to look at that work, to do that work, so do that research. Um, over like a five, six year period. And um, during that time, I, I very quickly uh, focused on transport planning and the interface of transport planning and um, uh, and uh, land use planning um, as a real issue for, for health people to, to get on top of. And that's really because we often in health provide a really good, strong technical support. Um, and I think as both the previous presenters um, have explained to you today is that there's a, a political element behind that and a policy element behind that that sometimes we we're not quite on top of. So that's really the the introduction to 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 the the talk today. Um, and um, I'm just struggling a little bit in terms of where my screens are. So give me a second. I've got to try and do something here. Um, I'll just do it this way. Okay. So. All right, so um, the the evidence that I was just talking about is um, it, it's, it's fairly well developed, actually, in terms of of the technical what we what we know technically about about health and, and cities um, and particularly um, how transport interfaces with cities. And you, all of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with the work of Billy Giles Quartai and team and 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 the, and the prevention centre that was talked about before and RMIT. And all, this is sort of a, a, the body of work that I'm drawing from. This was from from uh, Billy's work that she led for the, the Lancet uh, back in 2016. And it's really, really crucial for, for what we're talking about in terms of the, the causal pathway between urban systems, but then really focusing in on transport systems down to, um, to health impacts and hospitalizations. I won't talk too much about that because I haven't got that much time, but you'll see here that the critical points really are around, if you start at the left from urban policy systems through to transport, but starting to think about really what the risk exposures are in terms of, of various aspects of, of cities and our behaviour within cities. Um, but also down the bottom there is socioeconomic position. And I think it was Lauren was talking about before about how um, you know socioeconomic position really is, is a, as a fundamental driver of some of the challenges we see in terms of NCDs, but also, also city planning. And, and my area is really focusing on, on health equity. Um, so as the sort of driver of really a lot of the work we're trying to do in what I call broadly healthy public policy, including transport uh, and planning and health. So um, uh, it's a really great evidence base. I'd, 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 if you haven't read the Lancet series on on cities, go back, go away and read it. It's fantastic and it will give the, the sort of the, the basis for, for everything that you're thinking about in relation to today. Um, so when I started thinking about cities properly, um, I realised uh, that, that cities are actually driven by a number of infrastructure challenges. Now, those of you in infrastructure will be working or probably be quite familiar with a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about. Those of you who are from a health background, probably less so. But when you look at the, the challenges of, of what a city is trying to achieve in terms of infrastructure, the first thing is global competition. So, you know, the politicians that are making decisions on our behalf um, and for us are often 
driven by this idea of global competition between cities and regions. That is uh, mixed with population growth, because the more competitive a city you are, the, the, the more population growth you'll have. You're entice workers of a certain uh, you know, caliber with money, et cetera, et cetera. But population growth also drives real challenges within cities too. And that's a fundamental driver in terms of how transport planning and urban planning and land use planning more broadly try, tries to deal with is around population growth. Underneath that is how we provide housing, transport and jobs for our population to keep our, our cities global. Um, and within that, it also concerns with, with social disruption. So you'll see here, I've got a picture of Sydney. I am in Sydney and I'm quite Sydney centric. I've got one or two slides from Melbourne. So, uh, but this is basically a Sydney centric visual exercise, although the stuff works for other cities. So in, in Sydney, for instance, the western, western suburbs where I work um, are at great risk of social disruption. But what interesting that that's meant is that a lot of the infrastructure projects which are planned for have been geared towards getting Western Sydney moving from an economic development perspective to, to then raise up the whole of the city in terms of our competitiveness. Uh, economic infrastructure meets social infrastructure. Essentially, this is what we're all talking about. I think, you know, it, it, the, the previous presentation was talking about economics. Really, the, the challenge for infrastructure planning, including transport planning, is how we we use that asset driven infrastructure planning to meet and uh, and deliver social and social infrastructure, but not just services or buildings, but in terms of our social issues and quality of life that, the, that, that make our lives better. Uh, and finally, all of this is it becomes really political, so it's very highly politicised. Um, I'm going to move on now. So I just wanted to also um, to let you know that, you know, that there are some really great academic writing. A lot of it's coming out of Melbourne, actually, funnily enough. So people like Wendy Steele and Crystal Legacy are fantastic and, and they've really helped. One of the, when I started thinking about cities and infrastructure, well no, when I started thinking about cities, I didn't really know what infrastructure was and halfway through my, my thinking about what was really driving cities, I came across this issue called infrastructure and, and, and Wendy and, and uh, uh, yes, I'll talk about the 20 minute city, the question just came up in a second. And Wendy and Crystal really helped me understand that from a, from a, from a, from a deep understanding about infrastructure. I then went off and, and did some some research that was looking at, at people who are working in, in infrastructure all over the country and asked them about how we position health better. So that's what this paper here is about. So there's a lot of academic writing for you to, to navigate, um, including my own. Um, in terms of the 20 minute city, this this is from the uh, this is uh, some health service data that's showing you uh, occurrence of, of uh, highly uh, high body mass attributable deaths by Sydney LGAs. Now this is health data that's basically showing you the further west you go, uh, the more the more risk factors you have in terms of chronic disease. If you then uh, put that onto the number of residents that can be reached within 30 minutes by public transport, you can clearly see that there's the same pattern that em emerges in transport as there does for health. Uh, a report from the Committee for Sydney, um, uh, that's a, a peak body that, that runs industry as well as government um, uh, around urban planning in Sydney, in Sydney, about four or five years ago, produced a report that basically said taking a 30 minute journey during a morning peak, a Sydney CBD residence could access almost one million jobs, while a Parramatta resident can only access half that number. And what you can see here is the same thing happens in Melbourne. So this is a, some really interesting ex, uh, accessibility um, uh, data that's come from the federal government, I think, or Curtin University was was uh, was, was employed to, to develop the indicators. And you can clearly see here that the, the, the green to black, essentially when black is quite negative in terms of transport access, is the same for Melbourne, but going up, up, up north out of the city centre. Um, and again, these are because, you know, we're driven by global competition in terms of city structures that, that emphasise the centre of the city. Um, and that's where you know all, all roads literally lead to the centre of the city. In terms of actually doing um, you know on the ground thinking about what this look like looks like, this is quite a, an interesting uh, picture from Sydney about what not to do in terms of transport planning. And so you can see you've got a major arterial road here. You've got um, a big bus lane. You've got the, the a terrible footpath. You've got a, 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 bu a bunch of buildings that have been been recently developed, which are overlooking straight onto the road in terms of being polluted, etc. So that covers all the sort of things you shouldn't be doing in terms of planning. This actually was something I, I took, I think, from one of Billy's Twitter pictures, that, but it really nicely shows what we should be doing instead, which is um, at a local level. The aim really of a lot of this work is to get cars off the road. So you can see, I think this is from Vienna or something. So in 2012, 
terrible road, uh, you know, not very safe, lots of injuries. And then underneath it, you, you've got a, a much better, a much more open, uh, amenable public space. Although I would like to draw your, draw your attention to the McDonald's sign that's more easily accessible now than, than in uh, the, the previous 2012 version. So we can't win every battle. Um, OK, so the real issue, the real driver around all this, of course, is urban sprawl. So when we're de designing cities, so the, the transport planners amongst you will know this, is that you know, we, we're, we're struggling in Australia so, so much with urban sprawl. But urban sprawl has a, a, a strong, uh, there's the picture again in terms of the sprawl in Sydney, so more sprawl out west than in the middle. Um, and uh, the, the challenge with urban sprawl is that we are in Australia, we have a love affair with, with, our, with our cars. So this is a picture from a car park in Western Sydney. But more than that, we've also got a love affair with big housing blocks and, and thinking about our homes and where we live and where we want to live. And there was a really interesting uh, piece in The Guardian in 2018 that talked exactly about this. And, and this is the politics of planning. So the quote was, in Woodcroft, northwest of Sydney, housing remains crit a critical issue with people unable to afford even to buy on the, base on the edges of the city. So there's been attempts to rein in urban sprawl with high, more, more high density housing, but it's a highly political issue. On the one hand, you've got people who don't want sprawl, and then there's people who just want as many houses as possible to keep prices down. And there are people that have to have housing and they have to live on the outskirts of cities. So what is it that transport can do to alleviate uh, those kind of urban pressures are the questions that we need to ask. And I think the tool that, that will be presented um, it, you know, helps us think about that, some of that data. We've also got an obsession with toll roads in, in Sydney, Sydney particularly. Um, I did try, I tried to find a picture of in Melbourne. Um, I might get there in a second, but but we were essentially uh, in Sydney, you can see here that we're, we're driven by uh, toll roads. And that's because really a two, there are two drivers for that. One is that it's an economic driver in that, um, you know, tolls are for government less costly than public transport. So public transport is uh, uniquely costly on the, on the public purse. Although I would put to you that what is the public purse for? Um, and given some of the stuff that we're spending some tax dollars on, you know, I think public transport uh, is a public interest and public good that we should be investing in more. And also, you know, tolls are driven by, so this is West Connects mainly, the, the red line there is, is West Connects, actually driven by freight. So the freight task is a real problem uh, for transport planners, and as you would know, but, as you would know, but but from a health perspective, we don't really understand that the fact that these roads are put into place is actually to get trucks off the roads in the middle of the city and get the transport moving around the city better. So these are some of the things that, that people who are working in transport have to understand and deal with every day. There's also issues around, you know, public perceptions of these projects. Some people think they're fantastic and um, other people are more concerned with it. But the reality of the data is that the more roads you, you put in, the more traffic you 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 over the, over time you um, you uh, attract. So really, the, the evidence from all over the world is if you if you put in you've seen this from pictures of LA etc. Yeah, the more lanes you put in over a few years, they're just going to be filled up again. Um, okay, so but to finish my presentation, I'm going to go back and I, uh, to to the ATAP guidelines because there are so many challenges of trying to insert health data into transport planning that it's quite sometimes quite hard to see where you might do that and I saw a question in the chat about can we can we reconfigure or re redesign some aspects of the of the ATAP guidelines so these are the Australian transport um, uh, uh, planning guidelines and I think they're fantastic and they're a real opportunity for the work that you're presenting today um, to insert into different parts of the process so this is basically saying that 1a through to, to, to 7 is a process that covers everything from high level strategic planning. What's the problem that we're trying to achieve with our transport through developing business cases for particular problems to answer those challenges through to delivery and post completion review. So there's a this is a, it's a really fantastic thing. In fact, if anyone's got a, any research dollars, I really want to test over the years how many jurisdictions have put this into play um, and how much better the transport uh, planning is across those jurisdictions, because I think this is a a really good opportunity. I think in terms of going back to the goal of today, which was about, um, uh, you know, thinking about health impact assessment, the work that's going to be presented, I think, fits really best up around these very strategic level thinking of strategic city planning around what goals are we trying to achieve? What are we trying to do with our cities? What happens if we get people out of, into different modes of transport, et cetera, et cetera? Might also work through to, to policy choices and system planning. I think it will be really important for business cases, but I think it's important for business cases to come up with solid options before 
going straight into a single business case. Too often we see in, in, in transport planning, uh, particularly in the New South Wales context, we go straight to a road as the only option. And, and the data I think that you're presenting in your tool today is, shows that and demonstrates that often you know, we really need to weigh up whether or not that is the right option. And, and, and to be, just to reiterate, this is the process that, with which we can do that uh, uh, more effectively. And thanks very much. There's my email and there's my uh, uh, Twitter handle if you want to follow me on Twitter too. Uh, and I'm more than happy to take some, some questions now. Uh, yeah, so thank you. Every, uh, thank you very much there, Patrick. Um, and for those of you who are out there who would like to ask Patrick a question, um, please type it into the chat session and we can uh, open up for a bit of discussion. Uh, I thought it was a great presentation, um, Patrick and I. There was a question about 20 minute um, cities or 20 minute neighbourhoods, really. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that that you'd like to share and how this could facilitate the way we plan our cities? Yeah, so I do. Um, I. <laughs> It's interesting. You guys are actually leading the way with 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 your. I think now it's it's even got down to a fifteen minute planning process or planning data, right? So one of the challenges with with all with thinking about these um, these kind of big questions about what's the what's the timing between uh, you know a, a city centre or wherever an urban centre and where people live is that it's actually quite political. So I, I, an anecdote is uh, that was told for me from a Victorian person actually was. When they originally came up with the data for for the the twenty no for I think it was ended up being thirty minute city but so whoever was the transport I won't name names transport minister at the federal level at the time was presented with data around the fifteen minute fifteen minute city okay and he said we're never going to get that to fly in terms of the Australian public so let's make it the thirty minute city and fortunately what's happened over the last 10 to 15 years is that we've actually realized that the evidence does speak for itself and now that the, the lexicon is about a 15 minute city and I think in your transport plan for Victoria there uh, or for Melbourne there's uh, the 15 minute city up here in our in Sydney and our Greater Sydney Commission work it's uh, it's 20 minutes but essentially I think the data does say 15 minutes so and you can you sort of intuitively know that so if you're walking to the train in the morning you know if you get on beyond 15 minutes it becomes a real chore and you're more likely to get in your car so that's basically it. That's right. And we've we've also found some research that uh, 800 metres is a magic number if you're wanting to walk to food destinations. So distance certainly plays a role and that distance is connected to time. Those two things seem and to I would together. also say it's connected to the quality of the place as well, right? So you're you're less likely to walk even 800 metres if you're, you know, uh, in, a, in a, you know, dark, not well lit, dangerous sort of area than you are if you're in a you know, the, the highly lit city centre. So there's a whole heap of stuff coming to that. And I, I think the data you're going to present is is really useful in helping us think through what is it that we can do in terms of our environments to foster those kind of 15 minute decisions, etc. That's right. So in your presentation, you touched upon urban sprawl as being one of the key problems here. And as perhaps you might be aware, and maybe you're not aware, but um, we have uh, there was a, an academic, Paul Mees, who really uh, was fighting for the idea of having transport being uh, ubiquitously um, present for everybody. So regardless of urban sprawl, everyone has the right to have access to these sorts of things. But there, of course, are going to be tensions with how much it costs to do that and the fact that demand in these low density areas on the urban fringe is going to be low. Do you think there's a way that we can um, provide transport to these low density areas if we keep planning cities in that way? No. <laughs> the answer. So I, I, um, I, I, it's the million dollar question. I think we need to, there's a number of things we need to do is we need to reorient the public around what it means to, to, to use public transport and cars versus public transport. You know, as I've been saying all along, it's a highly political issue, particularly at local government levels. You know, local governments are always lobbying for, for, for roads to, to, for funding for roads, so it becomes a real challenge in terms of what we're going to do there. It's 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 interesting. I think you know the freight task is another one. You know how are we going to shift the fact that we've got so many that you know that the, the transport road system is driven by by dealing with freight for economic purposes, and that's a, a legitimate thing. I think that, that what needs to happen, and I think your data will really help that, is really high level com, you know conversations that. that happen about what is it that we really want for cities and also uh, you know to complement those high level conversations we need to have some kind of com uh, community engagement in the evidence itself um, and what communities really can start thinking about in terms of their own you know localities and their own lifestyles etc um to really sort of build up skills and 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 uh, critical thinking in that in that direction but it is it's a really it's a really tricky one particularly in the australian 
in the Australian context. Uh, there was a, sorry, there was a, a thing came through about the ATAP guidelines, which I'm intrigued about. So before we yeah, show, yeah. So uh, I mean, would you like to read that that comment out? It's by um, Julie Walton, I think. Also, has made a couple of comments. Would you like to read it out, Patrick? And uh, I'm having, I'm having challenge and get. I'll oh, just here we go. Hang on. Oh, I can challenge. I can read it out. So yeah, read it out. Julie Julie oh, Walton has. Have you got it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I followed the ATAP guide for many years. I do have not much. I don't have much confidence the answer lies there. Hang on, the things are coming in and I'm talking. Although I do think it's the heart of the problem. There are devotees of cost benefit analysis who do not count anything. That do, but, but. OK, right. So this is exactly in fact, I'm not the right person to answer this. So the co I forget his name, but the colleague who was talking before me does this for a living, right? So the idea of, of environmental externalities is really the place that that all this health um, uh, this health data and health information and more broadly social issues comes in and that does rub up against whether or not cost benefit analysis is the right tool for this. Um, I think there are other ways of thinking about the way we plan projects, but essentially what I like about the ATAP guidelines is it's not wedging you into a predetermined decision. Um, it's not saying, you know, roads are the only answer. It's saying what is it in terms of this the suite of options that we have to have that we can put on the table and whether or not that's done in practice, of course, is I don't know. But in, in theory, at least those guidelines really, really do offer a, a, an opportunity for guidance and regulatory change in terms of positioning health as part of those ex environmental externalities. Yeah. Um, we also have uh, another comment actually also from Julie Walton who was also just uh, pointing out that residential density is vastly overstated and this this came through from the great Paul Mees um, and he she says here that uh, here just to look at the level of service in other words people don't catch public transport that isn't there and uh, I think that there'd be a lot of transport planners out there that would agree with that statement that um, it's it's having good service that is fast and direct is actually the answer not necessarily having more transport just having good transport and having good good service provision. Yeah, yeah I agree I agree but I'd also you know I think Julie's comment I, and that's right I mean you know density is the issue so let's think about how a city is and that's what I was saying in my presentation one of the things Julie I think just to, to respond to you directly in terms of the, the the challenges you've got is that you know you it may be that the ATAP guidelines are, 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 are systematically biased against public transport but that's not because of the guidelines that's because of the system within which the guidelines are, are being developed and uh, and implemented hello Julie so what I what I think we need to be thinking about, and this goes back to my ultimately my, my beginning of the presentation, you know, you can bang on about data until you're blue in the face. We do need really, really high quality data, which is what this tool is all about. But we also need to have a really uh, strong evidence based advocacy movement to shift practices within departments and to that, so the departments respond to community pressures for for, for important changes in terms of this this type of work, you know, to end positively, you know, things like the ATAP guidelines have been developed by for a particular reason. They may have been taken on for the wrong purposes in terms of shifting roads, etc. But again, think about the freight task and all that kind of stuff. But I do think there are things that are in place from a from a policy perspective that we really can build on. And there's no point, you know, totally reinventing the wheel. But if we can get cultural change and, and system change including using data that, that you guys are going to present in a minute. I think we are, it's, you know, change can happen and we need to be a bit more glass half full, I think, with that as well. <laughs> I think that's certainly a good way forward. Uh, we've had another comment here from Matthew Jones, and this is relating back to the ATAP guidelines and uh, the idea that it's really focusing on cost benefit analysis, which may not be quite the right frame framework really for, for evaluating um, transport and infrastructure projects. So Matthew says that it's uh, it's not CBA itself that is a problem, it is the thinking behind the CBA. So in transport to New South Wales, I've seen projects that count slowing traffic down when replacing road space with active transport as a disbenefit. So he says we need to recognise that in an urban environment, slower streets are safer streets. And I, I certainly agree with that statement that there's a trade-off between what we value and I think what we're valuing is not necessarily factored into cost benefit analyses. Uh, I think there's a lot more work that can be done in this space, um, measuring intangibles and indeed um, having different ways of measuring health uh, and, and some of the benefits that come from taking um, different forms of transport. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that one, Patrick? Yeah, look, I mean, you know, you, CBA is an easy target, isn't it, to, to have a go at, but I mean, really, it's the application, as, as Matthew has just said here, that there's the real problem. It's what's the data we're plugging into CBA. I do think there are other things that, that, that you know, we need to be thinking about other than just CBA. Um, but you know, CBA is is a is a is a tool. Um, I mean, really, from a 
one of the, the big issues is, you know, if you go all the way up to, to premier and cabinet or, you know, the, 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 the fundamental decision making bodies within government, they want CBA and they want these really hard uh, uh, pieces of data that are more easily measurable for whatever with whatever assumptions go behind them. But w that's the ultimate challenge for us. And that's where your data comes in, is that if you presented a different model or a different type of data to them, um, what sort of decisions might fall out of that? You know, we, 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 we're never going to fight um, from a level playing field, the use of CBA and or the use of economics, right? What that's we can do is we can inform that to the best of our ability with the evidence like the stuff that you're, you, you're about to present on. That's right. And I think we've got time just for one more um, question here. And this is from Catherine McNaughton. Uh, and she says, why do we get a new freeway promised by each big party ahead of each election and no metro transport plan? Why a few big build projects rather than many small projects that benefit more of the city, for example, uh, uh, bicycle bike paths? Is it about keeping pipeline of same type of big projects in fear of community consultation? Yeah, I mean, I, this is another part of what I was trying to present with the ATAP guidelines. So, you know, the, the ATAP guidelines offer an opportunity that's apolitical, right, to, to put on the table the best strategic advice you can about what do we need to make a, a city or a transport network or whatever work based on the, the goals that we want to do, we want to have. The problem is, is that it's often politicised, as you just said in your in your. Um, in your in your your chat comment there um, and it's also you know that the public aren't really aware of the need to whether or not a road's good or not so here here the you know a, a good example of this is west connects here in sydney so australia's biggest biggest investment in public transport sorry in not in roads sorry sorry not public transport at all um what the challenge for that is that that there was never any other option than delivering a road when when we were when people were talking about back in the day is whether or not West Connects was the right fundamental public policy decision for for public investment, whether or not people instead with the government should have invested in the network, put all that what was it twenty four billion dollars into thinking about the transport network across Sydney, that was never really put onto the table, and that was quite damaging for for the state and for 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 Sydney um, as well because we're now locked into uh, a, a massive uh, a load of roads, right? Uh, with all the problems that come with that in terms of public tra transport not being invested in, um, in terms of phys physical activity, etc. Now, the New South Wales government will say, no, we were thinking about a network, etc. And, and they were to some extent, but the, all the investment really went into this one big project. Now, what should have happened, and 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 you know, we look at it now, and you know, it's there's no cars in there, and it's great because you can get from A to B in in 20 minutes flat. What that forgets is that the original options weren't, weren't made in public view. They were done behind closed doors. We ended up with pit, pit, you know, a, a road being compared against a road being compared against a road. And that's exactly what you're talking about. So what I'm saying is we need much greater trans transparency, perhaps using those, those eight, the ATAP guidelines and really opening up the idea of what do we want from our cities? And the public should be involved in that as well. And I think your data again, um, it, you know, will help that conversation. Yep, thank you very much. We hope that, uh, that our data is helpful for that conversation as well. Um, I think we're just about out of time in terms of our Q&A session and uh, I'd just like to take the time, Patrick, to say thank you for your presentation and also for the, the answers that you've given today in uh, in the discussion that we've had. Um, we might let you off the hook and move on with our next presenter. So thanks once again, Patrick. Thanks and sorry for having... messing up. Thanks for messing up my, uh, sorry about messing up my technology, which sort of threw me out for a bit, but no, it's been a, it's been a pleasure. And thanks very much for inviting me, Lucy and Bella. <laughs> Thank you for coming. All right, our next speaker is Melanie Davin, and this is where we're now moving towards the official launch of the Transport Health Assessment Tool for Melbourne. So we're going to start with an introduction to the Australian Urban Observatory. So Melanie is the Acting uh, Deputy Director for the Centre of Urban Research, and she's also the Director of the Australian Urban Observatory at RMIT University. Melanie has specific expertise in livability and the cross disciplines of applied public health and urban planning using qualitative, quantitative and spatial research methods and translation of this research knowledge into policy and planning practice. So I might hand it over to you, Melanie. Um, thank you thank very you. much.
Thank you very much, Lucy, for the introduction. And I'll just do the double check that this is what you can see on the screen. Yes, yes it very is. good. Yep. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to start today um, just acknowledging that as we're all meeting across the country, one of the positives of we could see possibly of COVID is that I am sitting in Melbourne on the land of the Woiwurrung and Boomerang people of the Eastern Kulin Nations. Um, and I acknowledge their elders past, present and future. And my introduction today is really to tell you a little bit about the Australian Urban Observatory for those of you who don't know and to provide some context to connect in both our new tool, which we're about to launch and Belen will tell you more about in a moment. So you can see the synergy and I think it is a really nice segue perhaps to some of those things that you have been talking about, Patrick, because there are plenty of things we're trying to achieve with some of this information that we're sharing with the community. So here is our lovely website and I encourage you to go along and have a look and at towards the end of this presentation I'll show you the link of where at the new transport health assessment tool is located in the observatory itself and it's fantastic to work with such an amazing team of people who've really pulled together our, our different disciplines and the, the real true interdisciplinarity that's needed to produce this kind of research. And I think in listening to Patrick there, you can hear how we, we really need to bring these different parts of our knowledge together to produce this information and work together. So it is not the specific expertise of just transport or just health or just urban planning. It's really bringing all of these pieces together. And that's what we are trying to do within this tool, the Urban Observatory as well. So I encourage you to go along and click through there. You can see that there's actually a little window on the front page and you can go along and um, play the little movie that will introduce more about the observatory in itself. But I'm just going to run through some of the information that sits behind this and what's included. So in terms of livability, this is the key aspect of what we're trying to do. So really the AUO, the Australian Urban Observatory, is a digital livability planning tool that we're really trying to see the connection between research getting into practical application. And that connection, as Lauren was saying at the very beginning of the, the session, we're really trying to seek some impactful research that's being useful. So for us, this goes back to a number of years working with many of my colleagues. We came up with this definition of livability back in 2013. And yes, it is a long definition, but this is critical because when we talk about livability, the first thing we really need to do is to define it well before we're able to measure it and we're able to track it over time. So this definition came out and you can see we talk about a livable place being somewhere that's safe, socially cohesive and inclusive, environmentally sustainable, with affordable and diverse housing, linked via public transport, walking and cycling infrastructure, to employment, education, public open space, local shops, health and community services and leisure and cultural opportunities. It is long, but one of the real benefits of this definition is when you are talking to the community, the community understands this, people understand this. One of the key things I would say to people is, what are you looking for when you're looking for a new place to live? These are the sorts of things we're actually looking for in the places where we live. So that connection is really important. I don't have too much time today, but what is also essential to this, drawing on these previous conversations and some of those things that Patrick has raised, is that I would describe livability really as the combination between urban planning and public health. All of these things are critical to public health and they also directly connect to the social determinants of health. Those being things like socioeconomic position, but also that where we live, where we're born, where we work, where we play, where we age, all of those factors, they're critical to our long term health outcomes. So that intersection between where we are, what do we do, how do we get around, these are really, really important factors. So livability, this is the real, the heart behind what we're trying to do in the urban observatory. So to move through and just to tell you what is this thing, 
Um, as I said earlier, it is a digital livability planning tool. So we're really trying to take this complex urban data and turn it into easily understood and communicated livability indicators for 21 cities across Australia. Why those 21 cities? They are the largest cities of Australia. There are eight capital cities, our 13 largest regional cities, and they're also home to over 70% of the population. Another reason we have 21 cities included is those cities match the national cities performance framework used by federal government to look at these changes over time in our largest cities. In terms of the indicators themselves, it's really essential that we're able to get a big picture understanding of what's happening. So the observatory, yes, because we need observation and understanding of these critical social, economic, environmental issues. This is really, really important. But we're also trying to do it in a way that's easy to communicate, easy to explain, easy to identify areas of strength and weakness in terms of livability. There's also that underlying health equity issue that comes with this, because if we're going to create intervention, if we want to address some of these strengths, or sorry, some of these weaknesses or some of these areas that really need help to improve or lift livability, we also want to do it in the places that most need it. Critically though, what is this doing, this project? It's really taking this research knowledge that we, has been produced with colleagues over many, many years. This is now coming up to around 10 years of research that's really underlying all of the production of the indicators themselves and has been produced over many, many years. And it's trying to make it useful as a tool for policy and practice. So the indicators themselves really need to be created with the shared knowledge that we have learned through research, connect them to a policy lever and to that understanding of practice for them to be most useful and create that impact. As Lauren said at the beginning, what we're really looking for is impactful, usable, accessible translation of research knowledge into action. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with the observatory. So what is the value? Why would you be interested? Why would you look at the Australian Urban Observatory? These indicators, as I mentioned earlier, have been designed to inform policy planning and practice. Because we work with partnerships, just like the, the Transport Health um, project that we're launching today in terms of our new tool, all of our work has been conducted with partnerships. So we're really trying to understand the needs of people who are working in that space, space that practitioner land, the planning and practice area, so that we can take that knowledge and embed it back into our research knowledge in the production of these indicators. Why they might be interesting? Because we want to design more effective policy outcomes for places. What is the point in us co continually investing in something that's not making a difference? Public policy, public funds for public people, but there's no point us doing this if we're not really creating that, that outcome what we're seeking to achieve. And this is where indicators are also really essential because we need to be monitoring and measuring over time to see what changes are coming but also understand the difference between that population level change and that program level change. So it's the connection of particular programs to policy outcomes at that population level. We also want to exactly evaluate, monitor policy outcomes over time. So it's great to have new policy, but we need to be looking at it to find out what bits are working, but what parts of that policy also need revision or change over time. Critically, if we're producing these indicators and we've done it for 21 cities, it's to make them available. There's no point everyone reinventing the wheel with something slightly different or very similar when they can come into an observatory and actually use this information without having to go and do that themselves. And this is another really important thing that Patrick touched on in his presentation. This is not about just producing information for policymakers. It's also highly important that we can share these outcomes with the community itself. We want people to be able to understand 
What are these benefits? What does livability look like in my area? Why is that area receiving all the intervention and nothing is happening in my area? Why is it that when I live in an outer area, nothing's happened in my growth area and it all seems to be happening in a particular area? If people don't know this, we have to bring them along with them, with us, with that journey of understanding about what's important and why these factors are really important for health. Transport does not sound like it's that connected to a health outcome. And one of the key questions I will ask if I'm delivering a guest lecture to someone is ask students, particularly transport or planning students, when you think of a health budget being announced, what are you looking for? Are you looking for the announcement of a new hospital or are you thinking about an announcement that's going to promote or prevent disease? And this is where that connection and trying to link up transport and health and that integrated policy and planning is really essential. So what's included in the Australian Urban Observatory? We have a livability index, we have a walkability for transport index, we have a social infrastructure index. And again, Patrick, going back to your point, Many years ago when we were working on this index, Lucy and I were both thinking, this must be done, it must be easy to define. No, it wasn't. It's one of the biggest um, indices in our whole um, platform at the moment. We have transport, we have food, we have alcohol, we have public open space, we have employment and we have housing. So these are the key domains of livability that we're measuring in the AUO at the moment. And we have currently 34 different indicators that are measuring these different aspects. We also are just about to launch an additional 10 indicators that are going to be uploaded into the AUO over the next week. And these include things like, there are actually a number of them. We did not plan this, but it happened um, Consequently, in this exact timing, we actually have seven additional measures of public transport and transport use. And as people were mentioning earlier, it's not just the, available, um, the availability of a public transport stop, but it's also looking at that frequency of service. So we're including new measures that are looking at 15 minute service, a 30 minute service, as well as a 45 minute service so we can understand exactly what's happening across those areas. Now, just to give you a little look, so you come to this homepage as I showed you earlier. If you're able to go through and register and log in, you'll come through to this mapping section of the portal. And here I will kind of make that gap between Sydney and Melbourne a little fairer, and I'm going to be a little bit Melbourne centric in terms of the maps I'm going to produce today, Patrick, just to even things out a little bit. So you can see here when you come into the portal, I've actually selected up here, you can see on the top right, the livability index and across all of our 21 cities, all local government area indicators are freely available for anyone to look at. When it comes to going down lower at the smaller geography of suburb or SA1, statistical area level one, which we refer to as a neighbourhood, then it's actually only two indices that are available free to the public and they are the livability index and the social infrastructure index. So I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of what that looks like. So you can see here, not surprisingly, when you look at most of our cities and even our regional cities, we see that the heart of the, the city is looking better in terms of our livability result. So green is good, red is not so great. And when we move down further, I'm going to click through another couple of um, slides you're going to see as we move through into suburb and neighbourhood level, how that detail changes significantly. So again, moving through to the suburb level, we can see we're starting to get different variation. And this is the key that you don't say that, or you cannot say that all areas in the inner are really great and the outer are not so great because we start to see pockets of green popping up, but we also see some pockets of red that aren't going to go away. So this is at the suburb level and again, moving through to the very small neighbourhood level. So this is average of around 400 people who would live in an SA1 across Australia. And in this example, I've clicked on an area which happens to be 
within the local government area of Whitehorse in outer eastern Melbourne, within the suburb of Vermont. And you can see there's a particular SA1 or neighbourhood area that's been selected. For this one, we're looking at the livability index result. And for livability, we score it at 100 to be about average, and anything below 100 is below average, above 100, um, above average. So you can see for this area here that 97.9 is the score that comes up on the livability index for this particular neighbourhood. You can also see underneath that we have an indication of what the other indicator results look like in that small scorecard. And then below that, we have some basic ABS census information. And further down, we have some other options that should ask you whether you'd like to look at a different satellite background because you want to try and identify a particular piece of land or a geographic marker. And we also have some new features in there as well. So we've included access to schools. So if you're looking at a livability result or you're looking at a walkability result in particular, that you might be interested to see what's the walkability of the area where I'm interested in living. Maybe there's a house where I'm thinking about living in, or maybe there's a school. And I'm looking at, well, if my child is going to go to a school, what's a school that's got great walkability around that neighbourhood? So we can zoom in and also look at primary schools and secondary schools across the country. Finally, when it comes to the transport health assessment tool, here is the new web address, and I encourage you to take this down. And if you go through to the impact tab of the transport um, within the AUO, you'll see there's a drop down menu and there's a transport health assessment tool link. So I encourage you again to go away and have a look. But before we move through that, I'm going to ask Belen to come online because Belen's actually going to come through and give us a real demonstration of what's happening inside that model. Finally, if you have any questions on anything you've seen today and would like to know a bit more, then please don't hesitate to contact either myself or Catherine Murray, who I know is also listening today. Um, Catherine is working in partnerships and development within the AUO, and we'd be happy to come and talk to you or run a presentation for your organisation. Thanks very much, Lucy. All right, thank you very much, Melanie. And what I might do is just introduce Belen. Um, Dr. Belen Zapata Diamidi is a Vice Chancellor's Postdoctoral Research Fellow at RMIT University. Her research evaluates the co benefits of urban and transport planning. Her work program includes evaluating the health benefits of different urban typologies and investigating other externalities of urban and transport planning other than health. She's interested in the economics of urban planning from a health and wellbeing perspective. Um, Belen, before I, I hand over to you, I might just briefly read Alan's bio as well because I know that he'll be giving a little bit of a warm up for himself as well. So um, we'll also be hearing a little bit from Alan. So uh, Dr. Alan Both is a research fellow at RMIT University with a background in geospatial and computer science. His research focuses on adding a spatial context to agent-based modelling. He's currently developing algorithms to generate transport networks, synthetic populations and spatial indicators for use in transport interventions. So it is my great pleasure to hand over to you, Belen, for the official launch of the Transport Health Assessment Tool. Um, if you'd like to share your slides and get started with your presentation, um, that would be uh, terrific. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Lucy, and thank you to you all for coming to our webinar today. Um, I will present um, some background information about the model, why we do the model, um, and then I will show you the model on a series of screenshots, just in case the technology is not there for me today, but you should be able to be trying the tool online as I talk. Uh, before I start sharing my presentation, I would like to again introduce our colleague, colleague Dr. Alan Both, who helped us a lot uh, with developing this model in the statistical language R, and his contribution was extremely important uh, to complete the project. So over to you, Alan, and then I start sharing my slides. Excellent. Thanks, Blaine. Um, that was very nice. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess um, uh, I originally started working on this project uh, because uh, Part of my background has been involved with a number of projects using the Vista Travel Survey, uh, um, which for those of you that don't know is a fantastic resource which is available. Uh, um, that there's essentially a, a travel diary for 
what what a, a subset of the, the population is doing uh, throughout their day, uh, where they're going, uh, what the purpose is for going somewhere, what mode they're using, how long it takes to go, all the sorts of things that um, people that are interested in transport are, are very interested in. So I originally became involved with this project because I've I've been working with this data. Um, so I usually use this data for building synthetic populations for, uh, for, for Melbourne for um, simulating in a sort of agent-based model to, to see where, where traffic goes uh, throughout the day. But for this work, um, I was mostly focused on uh, um, the interventions. So um, Blaine will talk a lot more about this, but uh, my work has mostly been centered on uh, how do we modify the current um, transport usage that that the actual travel survey population does and convert that into some sort of intervention. So that's that's what I was working on. And I guess in in future work, um, what I'll be looking to do is is to take it more local. So to, to look at a local area and see how these health and how these health impact assessments uh, work in a local community. So if, if you have a more localized intervention, how does how does that change the, the local regions or and surrounding regions. So that's that's the sort of thing I'm interested in. Thank you very much, Ellen. So I'm sure. Can you see my presentation? Uh, maybe Lucy or Alan can reply. Yeah, great. Yes, we uh, can. Yeah. Excellent. So I'm just going to get started again. I will start with a bit of background information, then very briefly over the methods and then onto the tool interface. So the main issue that we are addressing with the model that we develop is the lack of physical activity that we observe in the Australian population. And this is repeating uh, what Mortesa already said, that 55% of the Australian adult population does not meet the physical activity guidelines uh, time during physical activity, which says that we should accumulate uh, per week in between 150 minutes and 300 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity or 75 to 100 minutes of vigorous intensity physical activity or a combination of both. Um, that's for one week and preferably distributed amongst uh, most weekday, days of the week, sorry. Now there is another bit of the guideline that says that we should do two days of muscle strengthening activity. And if we take this into account, only 17% of the Australian population is meeting the overall guidelines on minutes and strength activity. We care about people doing physical activity because it's good for health. And this is, it's no news. We have known this for a very long time and we've got a lot of evidence uh, that indicates so. And if we improve health, that results in reducing the burden of disease. When I talk about the burden of disease, I talk about mortality, and that is premature death because people are not active enough, and also morbidity, which means quality of life. So the loss of quality of life because people have diseases. In Australia, uh, we have a local burden of disease study that measures this, the loss of life years or premature mortality and loss of quality of life attributable to a series of risk factors, being uh, physical activity or no physical activity, one of them. And this uh, Australian burden of disease study indicated that 20% of the burden from cardiovascular disease, diabetes, dementia, and some type of cancers is attributable to people not doing enough um, activity. This um, area of physical activity has been of concern for public health researchers and for a number of years now researchers have started to investigate the potential benefits of increasing population levels of physical activity through active transport, specifically through walking and cycling. An example of this is the study that I'm showing here which is a study that I conducted for my PhD that I did at the University of Queensland uh, with the supervision of Professor Lena Beerman, where we assessed the potential health benefits of the city of Brisbane achieving the travel targets that they had at the time, which indicated that by 2026 there were 
a parent, you have 15% of the most share walking, 9% cycling, and 14% by public transport. I must say they do not publish travel targets uh, anymore. When we did this analysis, uh, without giving you too much detail uh, on the result, but you can check the publication, we found that the greatest gains were from physical activity, and then there was a detrimental impact to health from an increase in road trauma, and those who changed from driving their cars to active modes also had a detrimental effect from exposure to air pollution. But the population as a whole um, benefit because of lower levels of air pollution as there are less cars on the road. We were not the only ones who did studies in this field, and there are many other public health researchers around the world doing this type of work. And now we have a synthesis of the evidence in the form of systematic reviews that group all these studies and present the information on their findings. An example of this is this study by Natalie Muller at IS Global in Barcelona. They do a lot of work around urban planning and health, where they summarize the evidence for the health in for health impact assessment studies of active transport. In this figure here that is part of this study, they show the proportion uh, of the benefits uh, for the overall health outcomes in each of the studies and the risk or these benefits. And what they found is that overall, most of the studies have the greatest gains from improvements in physical activity with detrimental impacts from road traffic injuries and air pollution for active travelers. Now into some local evidence also uh, related to our work. And this is a report by Victoria Walks where they did a very uh, in-depth analysis of the Victoria Integrated Survey of Travel and Activity uh, with a focus on walking, but they also have information on all modes of transport. And of interest here, you can see the uh, third column here, vehicle driver, is the distances that people drive for trips and people drive even for short distances. So 21% of the trips under one kilometer were driving, 40% in between one and two kilometers and increasing proportions of driving as the distance increases. And this is understandable. Uh, overall, for the analysis of trips, so a trip is getting from A to B, so I go from home to work, and this is taking into account the stage, so there might be multiple stages in the trip. I might go uh, from a house to the train station and then the train station in the other um, end, I might walk uh, to my work. But when we analyze the trip uh, information, we just take into account the longest mode. And when they do so, they found that 66, 16, percent of uh, the trips were walking. Now, they also look at stages. Uh, we are more interested, interested on stages because they include uh, more walking and they take into account all modes that are used to get from A to B. And the proportion of walking is higher because of the, all those little sections that people might walk to get to a destination. So about 25% of all trip stages, uh, according to the VISTA data, were done walking with a higher proportion in Inner Melbourne and a lower in Outer Melbourne and Middle Melbourne. We also did our own analysis of the VISTA survey for this um, study, and we used the latest um, data available. So that's for 2017 and 2018. And we found again for a similar figure about one quarter of the trip stages were walked and a very small proportion, 1.3% uh, by bicycle, and the highest proportion, 63% by car. I've got here a title that says an opportunity because when we look at that information in more detail, 
the distance category and agree with the Victoria Walks report, a lot of people uh, drive for short distances. So 15% of the trip stages and the work kilometer are by car and 52% in between one and two kilometer are by car and so on and so forth. And this is the very issue that we are addressing with our model. The health impacts of shifting is short to medium distances, to walking and cycling, or a combination of both. Now into the transport health assessment tool for Melbourne. So what our model is doing is quantifying the physical activity related to health impacts from a scenario where shortcut trips are replaced by walking, cycling, or a combination of both. This is not spatial. It's for the average Melbourne population. That is to say, you cannot go and check what's happening into your local area. We model the other population and we model 20 predefined scenarios that I will um, give more detail on later on. And this is a simulation model based on data that we have today and trends. We don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future. We know what's happening in the future from what we know today and trends for some of the input parameters. The model that we are using uh, did not start with us. It goes back in time, starting with this study by Jan Barendreg in 1996 that started, um, well, published the concept of the proportional multi-state life table, which I will show you later is the health model that we use. And this is also another related study uh, for the DISMO2, which is a tool that we use to be able to do the modeling. And also uh, it, it's related to one of the components of our model, the diseases processes. I'll give more detail later. And very importantly, this study by Dr. Linda Kobiak, which is the baseline model uh, from which all the work starts. My PhD work, what fair, further uh, expanded on this work and also a collaboration with the um, public health modeling group led by James Goodcock at the University of Cambridge, where I started to shift from the Excel based model to the R code. And we also still collaborate with this group and I will show you a project later on that we're currently working on with them. I will explain the methods very briefly um, and if you're interested to learn more about them, we do provide a supplementary, sorry, technical material that you can find on the website on the methods section. So very simply, we model two Melbourne populations, two Melbourne adult populations, and we are interested on their transport patterns, their physical activity levels and their health. We model a base case where everyone moves business as usual, no changes to transport, and 20 scenarios where we change this transport pattern. The model consists of two main sections, a micro simulation to model the scenarios, so transport behavior and the risk factor, in this case, physical activity. We do this at the, well, the trip level and also the individual level. And then a macro simulation where we model population groups. So females and males in five year age groups. For the micro simulation for the scenario component, we use the VISTA trip data. In our base case, nothing changes. And in each of the scenarios, we change the mode depending on the distance. For example, if a given trip is by car and it's under one kilometer, we have a scenario that switches that trip to walking. Using information from the VISTA survey, again, we model risk factors. Of interest to us is physical activity. For each of the VISTA people, we create a physical activity profile that includes information on their transport physical activity from the VISTA survey and also from the National Health Survey for Physical Activity conducted by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. We also have a base case, nothing changes, and also 20 scenarios. 
physical activity levels have an associated relative risk. We measure, well, it's the ratio of the probability of developing a disease depending on the exposure to physical activity. So each person has this relative risk profile for the base case and each of the scenarios. And when we combine that information, we calculate what's called the potential impact fraction, which really measures the change in disease incidence in our case, given a change in physical activity levels. In simple words, it tells us by how much the occurrence, so the people will get disease uh, changes because people are more active. All this information at the individual level gets aggregated and averaged by age and sex. And then we move into the macro simulation model, for which we use a model that's called a proportional multistate life table. Again, we model one proportional multistate life table for the base case without changes and one for each of the scenarios. The main components are diseases processes. We are modeling seven diseases that are associated to levels of physical activity. And these are ischemic heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, lung cancer, colon cancer, and for females only, uterine cancer and breast cancer. We model a disease process where we have proportions of the population that are healthy, become diseased, then they have the disease, and then they die from the disease or they die from other causes. Important information from here is the prevalence. So the number of people who have the disease and the mortality, the number of people who die from the disease. For each of our scenarios, these two uh, prevalence and mortality decrease because people are more active. That information gets captured in what's called the life table. The life table follows a population over time and it's used by the ABS, for example, to calculate life expectancy. You can also calculate many other things and we use it here to calculate life years and life years get modified. So we live longer if we die less by the mortality rate. And we also calculate health adjusted life years, which include this component of quality of life, which changes if we have less people who are sick. So health adjusted life years are life years adjusted for that quality. And it's something that we want to improve. We not only want people to live longer, but we want them to live longer and healthier. We also generate <coughs> outputs uh, from the diseases processes and we give information on the change in the cases of diseases. So that's incidence and death from diseases, which is mortality. Use a lot of um, data inputs for our model. I already mentioned the travel survey, the physical activity survey. We also use relative risks, and this is from a meta analysis uh, from the University of Cambridge again, my colleagues over there. We use information on population numbers and mortality rates and mortality projections. This is from the ABS, from census information and other sources. And we have uh, a number of inputs for the diseases, and this is from the Global Burden of Disease and also from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. After all that, now I'm going to show you a series of uh, screenshots about um, the model. So when you come into the model, as Melon explained, you need to go into the Impact tab this is the first uh, interface that you find. There are a few options um, that you can choose from to learn about the project. If you go to about, we give an explanation about what the project is about, why it was developed, how it was developed, then a scenarios, and these are these 20 scenarios that we model. The methods, uh, very brief on the methods, in here, but then if you're interested in learning more, you can look at our report. And if you have any questions about the methods, please get in touch with us. And the tool itself. So you need to go to run model. Um, I will just go back one. This might be obvious, but when you go into these windows, you see there is a little cross at the top right 
you need to click on that to get out and be able to access um, other tabs. So now onto the tool. We've got a few options for the scenarios to model. And this is here in the light blue square section. So if we zoom in, the first option is which trips to replace. And this can be all trips, and these are any trip purposes, including the Vista survey. So for work, education, leisure, uh, shopping, etc. Or commuting, which we define as work-related trips and education trips. Then there is an option on what mode to use and for what distance to replace car trips with. First, we have walking with a maximum distance of two kilometers. And we have cycling with a maximum distance of 10 kilometers. And last, we have an option to combine, uh, and these are mutually exclusive. So uh, in between zero and one with walking, one and two with cycling, and so on and so forth. We give options to whether you want to model, uh, sorry, see the results for females only, males, or both of them. And lastly, what age groups to model. Sorry, I just can hear some background noise. Someone might have the microphone not in mute. Uh, then when you, I'm going to show you an example for one of the scenarios. Here I've chosen the scenario of replacing car trips and the two kilometers with walking for all purposes. The first thing that you see is a description of what this scenario is actually doing. In this case, this scenario shows the results of replacing car trips and the two kilometers for leisure shopping and you can continue reading that and then we give some information of what happens to the transport mode share in this case uh, in text but also graphically you can see that driving mode share decreases and walking mode share increases we also provide information as in terms of how this contributes to the population accumulating the required minutes as per the National Physical Activity Guideline. And here we go from a shift from 53% to 60% of the population meeting uh, the guidelines for minutes per week. A second set of results, uh, it's related to health, in this case, incidents. So the new cases of disease that can be avoided because people do more physical activity. We provide two type of metrics. Uh, first, the percentage change, and secondly, the number of cases prevented over the time of this population. We are modeling a population in 2017 and move them over time. And this is the aggregate of all the cases of disease that we simulated for this population. It is a closed population. We don't include new people and the benefits are measured over the lifetime uh, of the population in 2017. So as an example, um, we simulated that there could be a decrease of about 4% uh, for the cases of a stroke, which translates into 20, about 27 thousand cases. We also provide this information graphically uh, for the percentage change. And also we provide information of how the cases of diseases are prevented over time. In this graph here, we have on the X axis the years since the scenario comments. Year zero is 2017. So we start in year 2017 and over time, these graphs are telling us how many cases are prevented per year with the shade uh, light blue there, indicating the uncertainty in the outcomes. Uh, this is a modeling exercise. We include the uncertainty in some of the inputs for which we have information, which implies that we really provide a range of outcomes. back these total figures that you see here in the second one the numbers 
uh, the summation of what we uh, simulate to happen over the time of the population. Towards the end, you can see it approaches zero because in 80 years, uh, most likely the people who were alive in 2017 uh, will be alive anymore. We also estimate outcomes for mortality, so the cases of death uh, prevented because people do more physical activity, and we provide exactly the same metrics, percentage change, number change, uh, graphically, and over time. A second health uh, measure, or two measures, that we also provide are health-adjusted life years and life years. These are positive outcomes. We want people to live longer and in good quality. And this is captured by this Halley's measure. In bold, we provide the accumulation of Halley's gain over the life course of the population. And the same as with incidence and mortality, we also show the impacts over time. You, I'm sure you have noticed that most of the gains are long term. Uh, these are diseases of the old age and just reflects that prevention really accrues benefits in the long term. And we do a similar exercise uh, for life years. There are some similar tools to ours, um, and there are many models out there, but when I talk about tools, I refer to online interfaces that people can use. An example is the Integrated Transport and Health Impact Model Tool developed for the USA. This model was originally developed uh, by Dr. James Woodcock for England and has been adopted internationally, uh, including us for some of the developments that I showed to you today. And here they call it US, USA, but it's just for California. And then um, many of you might be familiar with the Health Economic Assessment Tool developed by the World Health Organization for the European region, where they allow users to um, quantify the impacts of changes in transport mode. And they include physical activity, air pollution, road injuries, and also greenhouse um, emissions. I know that the WHO group behind the HIT tool is now developing a global tool uh, for all countries. We're also working on this space. Uh, we have recently been awarded a um, grant to work with the UK, where we are expanding the methods that are presented to you today. Uh, we're doing a lot of uh, methodological innovation that will improve the measurement of exposure for physical activity. And we're also incorporating the impact of transport on air pollution and health from injuries, noise, um, green space. We're incorporating some transport modeling component uh, to assess interventions as well. This work is here for Melbourne and also for a selected number of cities in the UK. And now um, I have this picture here because when I was putting this presentation together, I thought oh, it might be mission impossible really to shift people from driving their cars uh, to walking and cycling. And yes, it is difficult, but we have done a lot of difficult things um, in our lifetime as humans. And 50 years ago, we did manage to put a person on the moon without really knowing much about what was happening up there. So, while there is a lot to happen for this shift to be observed in reality, and it's not something the tool can help you with, uh, we start providing that evidence that says that there could be health impacts um, from people walking more and, and contributing to preventing chronic diseases, which is something that we need very much in Australia. So I hope that our tool helps you with that evidence to make this a reality. Uh, thank you very much. If you've got any questions, you can contact me or any other member of the team.
Thank you very much, Belen. I'm going to help you out here and manage some of the chat and questions that come in so you don't have to do everything in one go. And I'm, I'm sure um, everyone can see just how complex the actual model and the work behind the tool is and how it's taken and transformed into something that looks very simple from the front end. Again, a great example of taking something very complex and trying to make it easy to use and easy to understand. So um, thank you very much, Belen, for your very detailed description. And if you have any questions, please, now is your time. Don't hold back and we can move into some Q&A. And I can see there's already one question up here, which is a really great one from Catherine McNaughton. Any plans to share this with other the other HIA, the Housing Industry Association, in considering building more livable suburbs and housing? And I would nearly take that and extend a little because, of course, I had my own emergency question had I needed it, to say, who else do you think may be interested in this in terms of advocacy work? Belen, do you want to have a first stab? Huh, I'm just recovering from the presentation. <laughs> so we, can, we can share the load across then. Maybe Lucy or Alan, if you'd like to have a go. Um, well, a fair, let's let's address the first question, which is, are there any plan, plans to share this with other HIA? So y the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, there's nothing holding us back from sharing this with a very wide and broad audience. The tool itself is publicly and freely accessible, so there's no um, reason why they we can't share that with them. Um, and I think it's it's a really um, important and integral question. Um, this idea of livable suburbs and also housing, um, I feel like you might be missing a word there, which would be affordable housing because I feel like that's part of part of this paradigm as well. Um, it's it's certainly very important to be building these more livable suburbs and transport is a key part of that and bringing destinations much closer to people with this idea of 20 minute cities um, is absolutely integral to doing that in a way that is sustainable and also gets cars off the road and then creates health benefits. So the short answer to your question is absolutely in terms of um, sharing it with uh, the other HIA, so the Healthing Housing Industry Association. Um, but the second part, which was your question, Melly, who else should we be sharing this with? It's actually um, a wide range of people. It's not just um, those in industry and government, which to some extent um, are the people that might be able to use it the most for advocacy purposes. But as Melanie, you said in your presentation, it's also for individuals, for people. Um, and I think we said somewhere it, that this tool is about urban dwellers as much as anything else. That's that's us, individual people, because it's individual people that can also advocate back up towards uh, the government to say we want more infrastructure and this is the health benefit. And here's this tool that says what that health benefit is for our population, for us as people. So I think that's another important thing. Um, there's also nothing to stop us for sharing this with uh, all these other new um, forms of transport that are coming out. So it's not just public transport or walking or cycling. Uh, there's some of these other modes that also have health impacts. So some of these uh, modes such as uh, these scooters that you see everywhere, which is starting to be a little bit cutting edge. And there's health benefits that come from that too. Yeah, which leads to a question that Elizabeth O'Connor has posted on here. Have you considered modelling health impacts of shifts from car to public transport? Belen or Alan, would you like to comment on that directly? I think Lucy's really kind of answered towards this. Yes, yeah, I can comment on that. Yeah, that is possible. Um, so in the study that we did for Brisbane, we actually modelled the walking component to get to public transport. So when I was describing this, study, I mentioned that one of the targets was for 14% of the trips to be by public transport and the active component that would measure there was people walking from whatever they start the journey to the train station. So it is it is possible and there is evidence that shows that people who use public transport walk a given number of minutes, escape my head now, uh, per week, which contributes to physical activity. Uh, about a kilometre, I think, for Vista at least, um, in terms of, of the sort of public transport component, uh, we found on average it's about at least a kilometre for, for walking. Which is a great, great comment, Alan, because, you know, as you know, people tend to think about this difference in in the broader community. There can be I'm mm. driving or I'm using public transport or I'm using active transport, but it's all the combinations that go with this. And the mm. idea that public transport is actually health promoting may be something that hasn't reached 
general members of the public yet in terms of that incidental physical activity as well. But Lynn, one question that I think comes out of this that has been alluded to in the chat a little bit earlier too, there was um, a question about the household travel survey being the equivalent of VISTA, the Victorian travel survey in New South Wales. Um, and I'm going to put it to you, and after the last few months, I know you're going to give me a good reaction, but could this tool be produced for other cities? Yes, of course, uh, the tool can be produced for other cities. Um, and it's something that, you know, we discussed all the time and we thought that someone might ask uh, for this. But yes, in Australia, we do have household travel surveys uh, for a number of states. The study that I show you was for Queensland. Uh, I use the household travel survey for there. So yeah, it is possible. And if someone is interested in that, uh, they can get in touch with us. And all we need is resources to make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, great point because I just think when you have a data set like that sitting there, it's quite interesting. I could also say um, Colin Ma has said that for your information, the ACT government is using the WHO's heat assessment for some cost benefit analysis of transport projects, which is interesting to see. Well, maybe now we can say, um, Colin, if anyone's interested that we have a more local tool in development that they may be interested in. So please feel free to, to make those connections. Here's a final question from Derek Lim. Is the tool biased towards already built urban areas? Or sorry, is the tool biased towards already built urban areas? Or is it able to take into account new urban development? For example, not built yet cities as well. Will the assumption still be accurate? The model would assist in that. I think this is uh, more related to actually transport demand. Um, so if you don't have an area built yet, you don't know what the behaviour is going to be like there. So it's it's answering, it's asking a question that the model cannot address, but it can address what the health impacts could be if people walk uh, instead of driving their car in that area. And, uh, I don't know, Lucy, whether you have any comments. Yeah, I, I would agree with that as well, Belen. Um, it, some of, a, a key component of the model is it does rely on travel behaviour that comes from the VISTA survey. So if you don't understand what the travel behaviour is, it's very hard for us to model it. So it's quite a speculative thing to be modelling uh, for a city that doesn't yet exist. I think that's where it's a little bit tricky. Yeah, I'm also thinking, Lucy, one of the projects we haven't mentioned that seems very, very related to some of these questions is the early delivery of transport in growth area suburbs project that you, Annette, Robin Goodman, myself have been involved in for a number of years. There's much to learn from some of those findings that connect in here. Is there anything in particular like you'd like to comment on? Yeah, I think one of the key findings that we've had from that project, and um, feel, I'm not sure if Annette still there, I, I hope she is and feel free to jump in, is that what we found in the growth areas that is the accessibility to destinations is really missing in the growth areas and destinations, these are the kind of places that ordinary people like to go to. So it's the shops, it's the services, it might be healthcare, it might be schools uh, and in particular transport. Um, people in the growth areas are travelling much, much longer distances to get to those destinations. They really provide the impetus for travel behaviour in the first instance. So the way we're planning those suburbs doesn't necessarily facilitate facilitate accessibility in that broad sense. And that's one of the key learnings from that particular project from um, a built environment point of view. And of course, that may impact the health benefits as well, but not just in terms of physical activity health benefits, but uh, in terms of subjective well-being or just, just well-being in general and also social connectivity. So there's a lot of learnings from that project. And for those of you who are who are out there who don't know much about it, it's on the website as well, for the Centre of Urban Research uh, website, and it has a wonderful newsletter that talks a lot about the findings for the project. Yeah, thank you. And I have a final question in here we'll do briefly because I'm going to hit you to do some Slido questions, which are really some questions for us to learn more. So I might just take it as a comment. Sorry, um, John, you're not going to be happy with me saying that, I'm sure. But I, you make a good point because your question was how to include other Indigenous species, particularly forest and wetlands and habitat connections um, and their loss of which 
Oh, sorry, just as I'm reading, we had a new comment. Decreases our health, mental and physical. So these are important things that you could imagine in expanded models that could be included, but definitely a piece for future work. So just before moving on, I'm going to ask you now, I'm just going to hit you with um, five short questions. These are not too hard to do. And really, this is for us to learn about your needs as an audience. So we want to find out some feedback from you. So rather than doing it um, painfully, this is quite simple. We're going to use Slido to do this. And basically, you get a QR code that will appear in a moment on screen. And these are just some questions, either a word cloud, we want you to create some response, or, or just to say a yes or no. So there's only five of these before we finish up today and I hand back to Lucy who will just make some final comments. But if you can see, if you put your camera on that QR code on screen, that will take you straight through to these questions and we can literally see the answers appear as people like to do them. So the other way is just to go to slido.com and to enter the code of A388. We can see as people sort of put their answers in and the first question is, what would you like to learn more about following today's workshop? So you've heard quite a bit of information, but if there's anything in particular out of what you've heard so far you'd be interested in hearing more about, can you please just put the word in? So it's a literal free text response for this one. Here we go, nice to see our first response. It's all anonymous, so we don't know who's putting in what, so please have freedom to put in what you'd like to do, um, within reason, of course. And um, if you have anything that you'd like us to take away, this is a really nice way for you to communicate that through to us. So we can think about if we're doing future work, what sort of things should we think about and how can we make this so that's easy to do. So, OK, we can start to see now. I know there's about 70 odd people online still, so we may have dropped down to a few, but even if we could get a few results, I'm just going to talk through as we get a few of these answers coming in. As you see the answers, you may also be prompted to think about, yeah, that's not a bad idea. I've got some other ideas to add to them. So we can see we've got some information people are looking for in terms of applications, applications at the LGA level. I was going to ask a question about local governments and how this tool could be applied, but I kept that one to myself, so I wasn't hogging the question time. And also there's a few things coming in about agent-based modelling. How can we, how can we use it? Heat effect and tree canopies, methodologies, revealed preference, justification, impact, linking this work to impacts of climate change like heat and walking. Well, I'm, I could announce that we are working on a small project looking at climate change and health planning at the moment within local governments, but I won't do that right now because we're talking about health impact assessments and the tool of that Melbourne. Um, so please, yeah, we've got 19 responses. This will stay open as well, so that if you feel like you're going slow, just keep doing it at your own pace as we shut down. So with only a couple of minutes left, I'm going to move on to the next question, which is even easier. It's just a nice, simple yes, no. So our next question says, do you currently incorporate health and wellbeing in transport assessment or planning? So I like these ones. Oh, yes, because it's so <laughs> visual. We get to see and you get to see them change over time, which is quite fascinating. So this is really nice. The more we can get for this really does give us a sense. And of course, we have some sort of estimate of what we're thinking might come out with some of these questions, but it's really interesting to see. Um, some of the other questions, I, I'm pretty sure I'm talking about, um, they may get to organisational level, so um, we can worry about those as well. It's actually interesting to understand about individuals versus an organisation and where you're currently working. So we've got about 19, so I'll, I'll move forward to the next question. Next question, what are the barriers to using health impacts assessments? So this one is a word cloud, so please just free text again. If you can think, what is the first thing that you're dealing with when it comes to using health impact assessments and getting them used? What do you think are the major barriers? 
Yes, well, Patrick did hit on some of that political will, and you can see that this is quite a complicated space. And also a nice time to just acknowledge and shout out to the Department of Transport, who have been such wonderful partners to work with. And the ability to have that trust to work together has been critical to making this successful. And also trying to understand, I think one of the key things we really do need as academics and researchers when we're wanting to work in partnership is to have empathy and acknowledgement of the different organisational limitations from both ends. It's not just one way, it's about finding those places. Okay, we've got lots coming up in here, tedious. Oh, OK, willingness, willingness, I can see that coming up, usability, methodology. You can see how complex this work is. So, you know, Belen, you did a great job of talking something so complicated through and communicating with those who may not know about it. OK, so we've got 22 on that one. So please keep filling these in as you go, but I'll head on to the next question, which is, would you, here we go, or your organisation, use the transport health assessment tool for Melbourne. So, so we're not separating these into two, two different questions. I think, think about you and your organisation now. Would you use this? Is this transport health assessment tool for Melbourne something of interest to you and your organisation? And we have seen previously that we know that there's a number of barriers and perhaps this is where these two questions um, and the answers from them really link together. So we've got 80% saying yes, which is amazing. I actually didn't think it might be that high. That's fantastic. And then the very final question which is great. What would be your purpose? OK, so this one takes a little bit of thinking. Your last bit of thinking for the day, hopefully <laughs> all goes well. What would be your purpose for using the Transport Health Assessment Tool for Melbourne? What would you be using it for in your current role? Seller project, OK. Urban planning, benchmarking, behaviour change. And you can see when, when you get multiple responses of the same word, they're going to get bigger here. So urban planning, urban planning is coming up pretty, pretty loud and clear. Justify projects, impact, just another approach to validate what we know. Yes, but we need to not just preach to the converted, right? We need to be working with those who don't understand this. Assessing merits. OK, I think one of the things that I maybe didn't say loudly enough in my presentation even was that ability to bring colleagues along the journey too, not just people who are living, general public, but sometimes there's a lot of internal advocacy that needs to happen too. So this is great. Lucy, I, I'm sure we'll get some more responses. These are open to the end of the week. So if you forget or you go away, I'd like to share it with a colleague who's left already, please go ahead and do that and they can, can provide these responses and it's very, very helpful to know. So I'll hand back to you, Lucy. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Melanie, for facilitating the, the last part of this webinar today. Uh, in just making some very short closing comments, I'd like to thank all of our presenters for what they've done and uh, what they've presented throughout um, the webinar itself. Um, I think I think we've all learnt quite a lot about not just about health impact assessments, but also about infrastructure and planning and some different perspectives also from our participants. So webinar wouldn't be much without you as our participants. And I'd like to thank you all for coming and for your contributions also to our little Slido survey that will help us with our next uh, set of uh, webinars and seminars that will be coming later on in the year. So we will have other events uh, on that point um, and stay tuned for what they might be as they come through um, uh, as we develop them. So we are planning one looking at active transport and possibly at agent-based modelling and that will be later in the year, the second half of this year. So we have got your details um, because you registered for this event and we will probably send out an invite uh, for, the, for our next event um, as well in the future. I also just wanted to mention that the methods in um, the transport health assessment tool are also being expanded upon uh, in another project and Belen did mention did mention this and this is the Jive project and I think it's another exciting one to keep an eye out for. So in time um, and 
well, in time and in the future, we will be releasing results of the project as well. Um, but it's a really nice um, partnership project between um, researchers here in Australia and also our colleagues in the UK. So we're using some of the methods that they've developed to expand some of our methods in looking at health, um, in measuring health benefits. So that's another good project on the table that there'll be more results that we'll, um, that we'll be able to present on. Uh, finally, I, I think that's really all I wanted to say in terms of closing comments. Um, if you are very keen to stay in touch, um, please let Annette know. But we do have your details and we will um, just quietly send out the odd um, uh, flyer or invite to events as we go forward. So thank you all once again for attending our webinar on the Transport Health Assessment Tool for Melbourne. Uh, I hope that you have some time to go away and uh, play with the tool to get familiar with it and hopefully you can use it in your reports and for advocacy purposes. So with that, I'll close our webinar and uh, say a final thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks very much. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, right. everyone. Bye. All right. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Bye. All right. Thank you.